Welcome to uh, today's uh, December 21st uh, uh, South Maui CPAC meeting at uh, 5.30 p.m. And we will start with a roll call. Thank you. We have Chair Rob. Uh, Daniel is not in yet. Tova. Hi. Everett. Lehua, yes. Vernon, yes. Randall, yes. Mike, yes. Cody, Wayne, yes. Kiyoki, yes. Uh, Brian, hi, and Jennifer will not be here today. So just not quite sure if Daniel's coming. So Daniel is homesick, so we have two, two, two excused uh, absences. But we have quorum, so we can begin. Pilina mai na la la oke komike o la la o kai ulo no kapapa o la la no maui hema. Pilina mai no ho e kapo e o keke ena ho o la la o ke kalana o maui a me kalehu lehu o maui nei. I ho umaka ki kumo kaulana o kali koa ka eo o ke kula nui o maui i ke ahiahi nei. Aho ike na ho pena o ka ho okola nai o ana ya maui hema a me kona ho omana o ana i kana hona na mamua o mamua ma kihe nei. Ma hope e holomua kako e kuka e pili ana i na i kama kule kele no ki alakau ma loko o ka papa ho o lala. Now we were going to skip your introduction but since we're waiting anyway, what do you say? You ready? Okay. No, just joking. Aloha, everybody. So, just open whatever uh, we want to talk about, right? Sorry, to kind of, yep. So, Lehua Nani Harusten Hapoka, born and raised in Kihe. Kind of said that during our first meeting uh, back when we met in October. So, again, born and raised. Um, uh, my parents are uh, Michael Harusten and Beverly Akina Harusten. So, um, lived right across of the old Kihe school. Um, right next to the Pimentel pig farm growing up, went to the old Kihei school. Then we call this school the new school. So people, I still refer to it as the new school and people are like, wait, what new school do we have? So, but we moved to the new school in about 77. So growing up in Kihei, um, it's the only thing we knew. Um, our family is uh, a Kina family. Um, mine in particular is a, uh, my great-grandfather was Frank Akina and grand, great-grandmother Rebecca um, Kamakuhukilani Akina. Um, and my grandma is uh, Margaret Akina, married to George Akina. And my uh, tutu Margie is from Paia, and she's uh, Kaipo Ohana from Paia. But pretty much growing up in Kihei, we knew mostly the Akina family. And so just really blessed um, growing up in you know, a really large family. Um, one thing I remember is they lived on Welaka House Street, which is where we spent most of our time. Uh, if not, I was in Lahaina at my um, Huddleston grandparents' house, and they lived at the International Colony Resort, which my grandfather was one of the, um, I guess, developers in that area. So we'd go back and forth. Um, and I remember uh, on Welaka House Street is where we could eat with newspaper on the table, whether we were eating fish or whatever, it was just, you know, uh, newspaper. And um, when we went to Lahaina, my father would uh, beg my four siblings and I uh, to please speak proper English, um, to make sure we behave as we go and eat with our uh, grand Grandma Betty and my Grandpa Jack. And so it was kind of growing up, you know, in two very diverse cultures. But my father absolutely fell in love with the Hawaiian culture. So probably the reason he married my mother, who is Hawaiian, Chinese, with Irish. But um, being on, in, um, mostly at the Walakahau uh, house at that time, I remember my great-grandmother, Rebecca, speaking fluent Hawaiian and in the uh, patio area. And when you're small, you don't really realize how fortunate you are to hear that. But looking back in hindsight, that's probably one of the most beautiful memories I have of her talking with my grandma, Akina. And I do remember them laughing. But we never asked them, you know, what they were saying, what was the conversation about, because you just don't do that. 
you know. So my mother and her siblings could not speak Hawaiian. They totally understood it um, for whatever reason. They were not, um, I guess, encouraged to speak it. And I think a lot of people understand why at that time. And so we were never brought up speaking Hawaiian at that time. But one thing that was ingrained in us was just the Hawaiian way and whatever that means is having the utmost respect, you know, um, you listen, do as you're told, kokua and so forth. So um, ki, growing up in Ki at that time to me was the best in the 70s. No stoplights, um, yeah, very few people compared to now. Um, no highway, you could walk from where we moved to on um, up uh, by Ki uh, Lutheran Church. You could walk down to Kalama Park where we had soccer practice, everything was, you know, easy going. Um, uh, so I just want to close by saying um, I savor those memories. Very, I'm very thankful. Um, and if I could go back in time, I would ask my tutu folks to teach us, uh, you know, how to speak Hawaiian. But it's a poor excuse for me now because I could learn and I can just very, very little. But I know I understand the Hawaiian way, and that's one thing my grandparents had ingrained in us. So thank you for letting me just share a little bit about um, my uh, kihe uh, days. Mahalo. Thank you. Now, who's next? OK, Randall. Okay, I only had a couple of uh, housekeeping items, but I think we should uh, break after that for uh, for Kaliko, who's on his way. He's very near. Just probably stuck in a little bit of extra traffic. Hmm? Oh, he's in the back. Oh, okay. Okay, I just want to say that, um, let's see. First, that all meeting materials, all material for a particular meeting, so all the testimony and all the material uh, prepared by members of the committee, you can find on, on the KCA website, gokihei.org. And the other one is that uh, a lot of people keep asking me when we'll be, be live streaming, when will be when people will be able to participate remotely, but we can't do that yet. So in the meantime, just as a trial, I'm, I'm live streaming on Facebook to the uh, KCA Facebook page. So, and I posted about that too. So we'll see how the quality turns out, if it's worth doing or not. And then hopefully we'll be able to do a, a real Zoom thing uh, very soon. So with that, I'm going to uh, welcome um, our, our very honored uh, presenter today, Kumu Kalekia Kaeo, uh, Hawaiian Studies Program Coordinator at the University of Hawaii Maui College. And he will speak today on the impacts of colonialism on development in South Maui and also on his experiences in South Maui, past and present. Welcome, uh, Kumu Kalekia Kaeo. All right, we need this anyway, just for the recording, yeah. Okay, mahalo nui. Um, whatever it is, all the old Kihei gang over here, Lehua, Brother Cody, and uh, <coughs> Omakalo. <coughs> okay, kane hua vai aku a kena o kalina ko vai ho o hulu vai o kahuli ho ka o nua o pai a ikea o kamana e a ulo lo ta po o piha. O piha piha, o piha u piha piha e piha o te to oho nua pa ai kalani. O leva te au ya kumuli po kapo po no aloha a o au neo klei ko ka eo a hikiki papa no ke a moku no hoi o kula kula kai hoi a ka eno o mawaya ko ma ki hei ne a hanai ia a nui a a ke mana bo hoi wau a no ho ne ma waya huli mauka ma kula no hoi no lila aloha. All right, gang, uh, thank you for inviting me. I'd just like to really uh, express my thankful uh, wishes to everyone who invited me to kind of share. And I'm going to be very, very brief and very, very quick. I know it's 30, 35 minutes for me. That's, that's like one breath for me, if you know. I, I usually talk. And so I apologize beforehand. I can't get long-winded. Um, so this is just going to be a real quick survey, you know, kind of looking at It's a very huge topic that usually takes a whole semester kind of get, to get through. But I'm sure many of you maybe may know or may not understand a little bit about the context of this land that we call Kihei today uh, in regards to its political history, 
and specifically to the many changes that have occurred to this place and of course the many changes that will occur into the future. I myself am raised in Kihei, South, South Side Boy, um, went to the, what we used to call the old Kihei school before what now is the new Kihei school which is the regular Kihei school um, where I was raised actually with Lehua's uh, siblings, uh, Vernon's family also, his sister was a classmate of mine and we grew up um, you know, attending the old, as we call it, the old K school. Um, was also a, a proud graduate of Baldwin High School, as back then we were, you know, we'd be bust into uh, Baldwin. And I'm a Maui boy, went to UH Maui College, went off to UH Manoa, uh, got my so-called degrees there, and I worked at uh, UH Manoa for about a decade before I returned home and uh, work as an associate professor here at UH Maui College. I work in the humanities department. I teach everything from Hawaiian studies, language, political science, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And I um, kind of dabble in uh, many so-called fields that are related to uh, this interdisciplinary field of what we today we call Hawaiian studies and so forth. So uh, let me kind of just start by, you know, as you can see, <clears throat> one of my older presentations. As you can see, this is actually from a newspaper article uh, at, in 1897, if I remember right. As you can tell, there's Uncle Sam and he's lecturing the four new so-called students into the classroom. Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and Hawaii was added in, of course, because this was during the period when they were actually getting prepared for what became the so-called Spanish-American War. So you gotta understand, the Spanish-American War wasn't something that just had happened by chance. The US military already had been planning, in fact, uh, uh, measures and ways for them to physically take control of the so-called Spanish colonies. And so you think about colonialism, it's nothing new. In fact, Hawaii is a very interesting place and space in regards to the United States as becoming an imperial country. In fact, it's said that Hawaii really is the first land that is taken outside of what you think of being the so-called mainland uh, United States. Of course, we've got to think about Mexico also being taken, taken over today we call California. But in regards to being outside, of the so-called continent. Hawaii really is the first so-called uh, taking by the United States, and that's a long and complicated history too, but let me kind of just, is it making click on for me? I don't know if I have a, do I have a clicker? Let's... Okay, you can move it on, sorry, yeah. And we can understand, we as a consciousness, as a people, we, we talk one of our great so-called cosmogenies, the gonos and, and cosmos, cosmos, all that is around, gonos, like generation or genealogy in our, in our, in our world view, yeah, we are in fact descendants of everything that has come before us from the beginning of the cosmos themselves. And in fact, we see ourselves as having a familiar relationship with the world around us. And in fact, as we as the so-called human beings are the last of those so-called siblings within this family. So even from our world view, yeah, uh, we were not granted the idea of being having dominion over all things that fly and run and, and so forth, but in fact, saw ourselves as being a part of this this huge giant family, in effect. So everything around us, even the so-called land itself, the trees, the birds, the, the plants, are all, in fact, siblings in this huge family. So when you think about just that kind of ideology or philosophy of life, that's a very different worldview from what you find in the kind of Euro-American ideologies, which, of course, see the world as something to be dominated, and even through the biblical sense of having dominion. What does the word dominion mean? I mean, you can see the foundational ideas, the world around is something to dominate, to own, to hold, to control, to use, to exploit. That's a very different worldview. And in fact, I believe that's why we're in the trouble we are today in this world is because of the so-called sickness of that worldview. Okay, we can move on. We have our own stories like the Papa Wakea stories, another cosmogony which we have here again. Not just relations, but in this, in this uh, to the land itself, but even the idea of the food within the structure of this family. We have the so-called gods, and then you have the land itself, and then you have the kalo, or the taro plant, which is an older sibling in our cosmogony. I mean, it might sound silly in a sense of, of thinking of a plant being older, but if you think and understand, even at a scientific level, we realize everything around us, in fact, are physically related to us. We all share so-called DNA. And as I was told and, and taught by one of my uh, professors, even the banana, well, let me ask you guys, how related are we to a banana? Well, you'd find it something like 71% shared DNA with a banana. 
So the idea that in fact that we are part of the environment and related to everything around us is nothing new. In fact, I would say that's a progressive ideology. And an ideology that re, uh, uh, refuses to accept that, in fact, that's regressive. Okay, moving on. Of course, as a people, we've moved through the Pacific. Of course, coming out of Africa about 80,000 years ago, got into what we call Sahul, into Southeast Asia, and migrated into the Pacific. And we've been here for a long time. Uh, we have some interesting genetics and no time to go through all of that also. We come from those who were the first people actually to leave Africa. And we're also from the latest great migrations to leave Africa, only about 12, 13,000 years ago. And the genetics mixes together, we end up with today what we call the so-called Polynesians. So we've always been on the move. And in fact, this is perhaps one of the main reasons why we spread across the Pacific Ocean. A third of the planet, in fact, is covered by this ocean. Okay, next. We have many of our stories of migrations. Here's a story of Moikeha. You can go next. Sorry. Hema Ekane. Pa'au. And so my, my point is, this idea that somehow we just drifted here on, on, on wood and we just kind of by chance got here is all a bunch of course malarkey as they would say today that we always understood that we purposely settled and colonized the Pacific Ocean throughout the islands. In fact, today scientists say that even Polynesian DNA you find across places, even in places like South America and Guatemala and other places around the world. So we have always been a moving people, moving and searching for new homelands. But within our history, we always talk about, in today in Hawaiian studies, when we talk about history, we talk about pre-Wakea, which is basically pre, you know, 110 generations ago. And then we have a period from Wakea to Pa'au, which a lot of people describe as being their very old, ancient, traditional uh, society, kind of pre-hierarchical, you know, kind of, so you can think of the, the first so-called settlers coming here, um, uh, where there's a lot more egalitarian society and probably a smaller number of, of residents back then. But then quickly after the arrival of Pa'au, we, we had a change in the hierarchy of the system. And that went on, of course, to the time of Kamehameha. And Kamehameha is an important, in 1810 is when he actually unites all of the islands under one so-called rule, uh, which became known as the Hawaiian Kingdom. And from that point on, from the Hawaiian Kingdom period, into roughly about 1893, depending how you look at the history, yeah, before the so-called American takeover and uh, illegal occupation of these islands. So, yeah. uh, we had a society uh, built upon chiefdoms, and I kind of always liken them to, like, if, you, if you ever watch Game of Thrones, I mean, you had our own kind of Game of Thrones going on here with different lines and different genealogy. You know, you get the different so-called houses, and they're always jockeying for position, they're related, and yet they're you know, they're fighting for the control politically and economics of the islands, yeah. And so Maui, as you can see, Maui Nuiya Kamala Lavalu, or you might hear Maui Akama is a common epitaph, of course, which directs our attention to Kama, who was seen as, you know, during the golden period where a lot of the advances in society, uh, whether it's the development of fish ponds and aquaculture or development of the kind of organic uh, farming, horticulture on the islands, all developed in these periods, and so it drove the populations to a very, very high rate. Okay, sorry, wait. We had a traditional society, yeah, of, of Ali'i, the Maka'ainan, the common people. Yeah, wait, sorry. A land management system, you can see older maps here, where, as you can tell, the way the system would be dividing up the islands was based upon, really, the resources of the islands, whether it's from the ocean up into the, the, the agricultural fields and, of course, up into the uplands. And so much of our, our units in which the lands were managed, really ran from up Mauka to Makai. Not east, northeast, not southwest. Yeah, that's a, that's a European kind of construction of seeing the world. In fact, in the Hawaiian worldview, everything moved either from east to west because of the rising of the sun and the moon and the stars that move in that direction, or the idea of something from the uplands being connected to those things in the, in the lowlands and the ocean. Yeah. Of course, you can see our traditional <clears throat> uh, land maps here, and that's Maui. And I'm sure you can all see that, that light blue color in there. That's the old section of today, what we call Kula. And it goes all the way to the top at, uh, 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 shocks my brain. Okay, brain freeze. To the top of Kole, Pu Kole Kole, all the way down, of course, to the, the seashores. And you can see all those little lines kind of running from Mauka to Makai, and those are all some of the various so-called Ahupua'a. Now, Maui is a very funky island, 
you know, the traditional kind of way of talking about moku, and so we see that the various colors are the moku, the larger land sections, and the smaller land sections, which the everyday people would live in, what we call the ahupua'a, uh, really, you know, those are the ones that ran from Mauka to Makai. Maui is very interesting, and you can look at some place like Big Beach, what we call Big Beach, Keoniloa, and they're like four or five ahupua'a just in that one, one stretch also. So Maui has some very interesting ways in which lands were managed, especially on this side also. So there's specific things about Kihei, in fact, uh, or Honua Ula, in which uh, how lands were managed are very different compared to other islands. Okay, go ahead, sorry. And the smaller land sections, Aupua, as you can see. And you know, this number kind of fluctuates depending on which map you look at, at what time, and by whom. Um, but as you can see, within the Kihei area, very, very large Ahupua. Across 1778, uh, the first recognized European to come to the islands, Captain Cook. Um, you know, his interest, of course, was to um, scientific inquiry in a sense, but science has always been hand in hand with so-called settler colonialism and the idea of finding ways to exploit natives and native lands. You know what I'm we should recognize also, we talk about our islands, like in Hawaii specifically, it was recognized the history of depopulation. It is said when Captain Cook arrived in his islands, the low estimate today, people look at something like 400,000 by Captain King, that's in 1778. By 1890, the native Hawaiian population dropped down to 40,000. Now if you look at a lot of the demographers that look at the information today, having 800,000 to a million in fact is pretty on the conservative side. But think about that, if it took 800,000 in 1770, by 1890, only 40,000 Native Hawaiians survived. So roughly only one in 20 survived that period. And so for Native Hawaiians, we always say, our lives are not cheap. You know, we come from only 5% that had survived. And so we, we have a very, uh, we should hold our lives very, very you know, valuable as, as something that we should always cherish. Sorry. 1810, Kamehameha again unites the islands. England, sorry. Uh, he passes on and his rule is then passed on. It's kind of split in two ways. His, his son, Liho Liho, becomes the next ruler. His uh, so called favorite wife, Kahumanu, becomes the Kuhina Nui or the prime minister. Now, you can just the terminology realize it sounds very British, and that's because the Hawaiian kingdom was part of the British Empire at this time. Many people don't realize the Hawaiian kingdom, in fact, was a protectorate under the, uh, uh, Captain Vancouver at this time. That's why Liho Liho is using the those red, the red color. And in fact, that's why Liho Liho then travels to London and eventually dies in London for measles along with his wife, Kumamalu, at that, at that time. So, okay. 1819, the Ainoa, where the so-called spiritual base of these islands are, are turned over, and this is a huge kind of um, event in these islands where the old ways basically are undone. Yeah. And much of it has to do with the idea of the depopulation that had been going on at that time. Yeah, sorry. Um, after Kamehameha II dies, his younger brother, Kamehameha III, Kaui Keauli, who was raised in Lahaina, and during this period, of course, that's why Lahaina was recognized as the so-called capital of the Hawaiian kingdom. It's also there where the greatest changes in the Hawaiian kingdom occurred is under Kaui Keauli's rule. Um, Hawaii transforms itself from an absolute monarchy into a constitutional monarchy. Now, this is very early on in history. If you go and study world history, Hawaiians are actually pretty advanced, even in regards to organizing governance. Yeah, and uh, yes, a lot of it had been influenced by what was going on in Europe, but much of those kinds of progressive ideas in Europe already had found their ways into Hawaii, including ideas like compulsory education. In fact, it said Hawaii is the first country in the world to have compulsory education for every child between 4 and 15, male and female, rich and poor. Compulsory education. Now, you got to compare. When this was in, in 1826, who was being educated in the United States. So quickly, in one generation, Hawaiians went from being a people who was basically illiterate, in one generation becoming recognized, in fact, as the most literate society in the world. So most people don't realize that we come from a people who, of high advance wanting and desiring for education. It's the miseducation we don't want, you see. You gotta understand, there's a difference between educated and being miseducated. And so, okay, sorry. 1826, we have our first so-called uh, uh, treaty of friendship from the United States. So early on, the United States, of course, wants to have this relationship with Hawaii. 
and so they agree to have uh, trade. Yeah. Now, it's important to recognize early on, in Lahaina also, at Moku'ula, on the little uh, milo tree, it is said that the first draft of the first Declaration of Rights for the Hawaiian Kingdom was, was written there. Um, and what's important about the Declaration of Rights, it recognizes the so-called three classes of people, so-called government, the chiefs, and what we call native tenants, or the whole aina, we'll come back to the word later on. And also that people were given so-called vested rights into the lands. Now, which lands? And you're gonna see, it's gonna say all lands. And this is part of, part of the kind of uh, reasons we have much of those kinds of controversies over land disputes and land title in Hawaii today. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, next. In 1840, the first Hawaiian Kingdom Constitution is written, followed, yeah? Um, and it also creates the so-called three arms of government. It also, uh, early on, uh, regulates the powers of the so-called chiefs, including the so-called king. So from then on, the so-called king was not an absolute monarch. The king or queen would be uh, regulated by the so-called uh, constitutional law. Yeah. As you can see, 1840 constitution, that's Ke Kauluohi. She's a granddaughter of Kamehameha. I want you to pay attention. She signs the Hawaiian kingdom's first constitution. I repeat, she signs. We've never had issues with women holding political power in our islands. This is something the United States is still trying to figure out. But my point is, early on, women had political power in these islands. And I just got to say this, kinda, I had a funny, interesting conversation. Another professor was saying, you know what, back in the old days, Kaliko, you guys oppressed your women. They couldn't eat bananas, they couldn't eat coconuts. I said, you're right, but we never burnt any of them on the st at the stakes, that's for sure. You want to compare? Let's compare history of treatment of women. You know, so before you come and play this kind of game of who and who is, let's go and talk that story. I have no problem. So early on, women had this kind of political power. It also said in the Declaration, all land held in common. I repeat, all land. This is a revolution, a bloodless revolution with a so-called king who controls and owns all land. Says, who owns the land now? All of us. Did it ever happen in Germany? Happened in France, Spain, the United States? No. My point is, the Hawaiian Kingdom was not based upon a, some kind of copycat of a European society. From early on, it was based upon ideas that we all share. We all have kuleana, as we say, in these lands. That's foundational from our culture. Yeah, sorry. Early on, newspapers that we've had through the islands, people again, because of the huge reading population. Um, in 1834 um, was the first uh, Hawaiian language newspaper that was printed. Sorry, wait. And you can see we had several books, anatomy books, mathematic books. Uh, you had the great classics, you know, Ivanhoe and 10,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Tarzan, you know, uh, Hamlet. was all translated into Hawaiian also, besides our own great stories. So we were worldly in regards to understanding our history and understanding world politics. Now, compare that to the common United States 14-year-old in Massachusetts. So we were the people that were reading and understanding what was going on in the world. Again, education has always been the key. Sorry. 1843, the British take over Hawaii for a very short period. There's a, 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 a where uh, <clears throat> uh, Paulette comes in and basic gunboat diplomacy. Then they send another admiral. Admiral Thomas comes in and kind of saves the day and restores the Hawaiian sovereignty to King Kamehameha III, and this is where the same, the famous words, uh, sorry, the famous words, Uamau, Kea, Okaaina, Ikapono comes from. It's not some kind of environmental, you know, some kind of whatever that they use it for today. It has a very clear historical understanding. It means that the sovereignty of the land will be perpetrated because of doing what's right. Okay, sorry. Now, this is probably the most important date also. In 1843, November 28, a uh, Hawaiian delegation led by, uh, oh, I thought it was my hat, Ha'ali Leo, go at Simpson, uh, and, and um, sorry, um, it's buried in Lahaina. I had fun. Anyway, they go off to uh, Europe, meet with the French, actually the Belgium uh, delegation helps them out, King Leopold, and they eventually meet with the French and British, and they create what's called the Anglo-Franco Proclamation, whereby Great Britain 
and France jointly announced that they recognize yeah, the independent sovereign status of the Hawaiian Kingdom as a co-equal, as part of the family of nations. So I want to understand, from November 20, 1843, Hawaii becomes a co-equal, a sovereign and independent recognized. Hawaii is the first non-European recognized country in the world. Little islands in the middle of the Pacific. In fact, Hawaii is the only Pacific country to have been recognized through that process. And so we talk about ideas of sovereignty and independence. This is nothing new. This is part of the so-called DNA of these islands. The question now becomes, what happened and, and, and so forth. So, yeah. 1848, we have the Mahele. This is the dividing up the lands, the beginning of the so-called privatization of the lands. Now, let me be clear. From the onset, it was clear, and it says all lands, and you're going to see those, those words, koi na kuliano kanako, koi no na eke kuliano kanako, which basically says, except for the rights of the native tenants, meaning, lehua, you get awarded all of, uh, I don't know, waiakoa, that's all yours, except for the rights of the tenants. If all land title in Hawaii has that condition of title from the very beginning. It was never 100%. It was always 100% minus X. The question has always been, what is the X is? That's including rights to access, rights to gather, rights to go to the ocean, rights to go to uplands, rights to do uh, cultural and religious activities. Which lands again? All lands. That's what it says. Okay, sorry. Sorry, I don't have time to go, sorry. I know. Saw the land commission royal pair. Sorry, I gotta run through this stuff. Okay, stop right there. Sorry, go back. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, just to show you. So this is an example. When you think about when you think about lands in Hawaii, we always gotta recognize two important land resources called so-called Hawaiian crown lands. And crown lands are lands that were attached to the so-called crown, whoever was the king or queen at that time. Their own private, and again, their own private lands. It was a crown lands. Government lands were lands that were controlled by the Hawaiian Kingdom government. And they're, you know, as you can see in this map, and just so, it says 19, oh, sorry, 1885, brought up to date in 1903. And you can, if you look at the map, you look at Kihei, what do you guys see there? Much of the lands you see, what we call Kihei, were also Hawaiian Kingdom. In fact, we stand on some of these lands right here. Hawaiian Kingdom crown and government lands. So when Hawaiians talk about lands belonging to our people, we're not making it up. We got all the evidence we can have. The question is not just about evidence. The question, of course, comes down to political power. But that still doesn't erase the evidence. You see, that's the point. And so, as you can see in this map here, when you talk about Kihei, you got to recognize much of Kihei are on lands that are disputed and will continue to be disputed, whether you like it or not, unless you can change the facts. You don't have to face those kinds of challenges. I mean, you may want to hide, you may want to pretend, you may want to, you know, close your eyes, but those are still the facts. In fact, I will challenge any of you out there, I will give up my professorship if you can prove what I just said was false. Yeah. And if you lose, you get, then you can leave Kihei. How about that? Okay, go ahead. Again, just to understand our land tenure system, we have, you know, these are all recorded, everything you can find again, all at the Bureau of Conventions and Archives and so forth. Wait, sorry. As I talked about crown lands, as you can say in 1865, henceforth in Eilinuban shall descend to the heirs. Again, so these are some of the lands that we find in Kihei. Sorry, go ahead. Government lands, sorry. One of the things to also remember, Hawaii was not just an independent nation state. Hawaii, in fact, was one of the first nation states to be recognized as neutral and having neutrality, just like Switzerland you have today. Hawaii, in fact, was considered the Switzerland of the Pacific. Now, does Switzerland have an army? How come? Why, did, why didn't Germany invade Switzerland in World War II? Because they cannot. It's illegal. Hawaii, from 1860, oh, sorry, 1854, actually connected to the Crimean War, was a recognized, not just an independent nation state, but a state that had recognized as having neutrality, whereby no other so-called foreign powers could use Hawaii as a military port, 
uh huh, or um, you know any kind of projects to um, to uh, further impede into the sovereignty of other so-called countries. Okay, wait, sorry. Kamehameha IV, 1854. Sorry, I just couldn't just Kamehameha V, Lunalilo, Kalakaua. Let me just stop right there. It's also a very quick. To understand early on the United States, this is where the United States starts to kind of prowl around Hawaii. And they really begin because now they're trying to get interested, especially in trade, trade with Asia, to control the Asia market. They looked at Hawaii and Senator Blaine says, Hawaii was the key to the dominion of the Pacific. So early on they needed Hawaii and what they wanted of course was Pearl Harbor. And later on what became Schofield Barracks. And Hawaii from that point on the planning from the United States was to get Hawaii to use Hawaii as a military outpost. And since then, we've always been a military outpost for the United States. And so the Treaty of Reciprocity was something that Kalakaua travels to the United States and he's able to negotiate. Remember, the United States had just finished, of course, the Civil War. The South is down, there's no, there's no, there's no sugar being grown. Sugar is a high valued commodity. Well, Hawaii at that time just began to grow sugar. Hawaiian sugar goes up. The, the European and American interest in Hawaii who begin the sugar companies, I mean, they become incredibly wealthy, and this pushes this kind of drive to expand sugar. The Hawaiian population is dropping at this time also. Yeah, so what do they need now? More labor. So now they start to bring in so-called labor, at the first with the Chinese and, and others at that time. What's important about Kalakaua, Kalakaua goes there. He's a, he's a very interesting character. He's able to basically negotiate with the United States and says, okay, Duty free, he's gonna bring Hawaiian sugar into the United States and basically does it with any, without any kind of concessions. Later on, the United States, of course, will ask for what? Pearl Harbor, and this becomes the main issue, which later on creates a so-called uh, overthrow, so. Kalakaua in 1881, head of state of Hawaii. Kalakaua is the first head of state, president, prime minister of any country in the world to circumnavigate the planet and travel the world. It was Hawaii. He also helps to set up the International Postal Service. He helps to set up much of those kinds of international laws and rules that you have today, began with people like Kalakaua. In fact, uh, I think there's a, yeah, he actually goes up even to um, Japan. And let me tell you an interesting story. When he goes to Japan and meets with the delegation there, the Japanese ask, and I shouldn't say, I should probably use a stronger, ask very strong, I don't wanna say big, that might be a little too much, that the Hawaiian kingdom recognized them as an independent nation state. And who do you suppose becomes the first country in the world to recognize Japan as an independent nation state in January of 1893? The Hawaiian kingdom. So, so if Japanese nationals should always remember that. Okay, good. He comes back from this world trip. He says, hey, the European kings and queens, they got palaces, I want one too. And so he builds what becomes the Iolani Palace. He takes his crown, he crowns his own self. By doing so, at first he's kind of seen as this kind of very pro-progressive American uh, you know, personality, but quickly those interests in Hawaii, they start to hate him because they realize that he, he doesn't want to really play the game. And so they start to plot and figure ways how to um, take power away from Kalakaua. And this really pisses them off when he holds his own coronation, a one-week party basically at, at um, Iolani Palace. 10,000 people showed up. He brought back the hula again, how dare. That comes right out to the public eye and that creates this huge conflict. And so began the end of his power structure as the, the so-called white elite in Hawaii really uh, hated his um, audacity to not want to you know, support their continued efforts to gain more and more and more wealth. So I've always said this, those who have always wanted to gain more and more and more wealth has always been the enemies of our people in Hawaii, has always been the enemies to our people in Hawaii. And I can prove that without a, you know, without a doubt, okay? 1887, the Bayonet Constitution, this is really the first half of the overthrow, and <clears throat> Kalakaua loses political power, and I, I don't have time to kind of go through all of this, this history. Uh, when he dies in San Francisco in 1891, his appointed sister, Lydia Kamakaeha Lili'o Kalani, becomes the queen. Very astute, very smart. She was a very progressive woman. She first started the first woman's bank, very strong woman liberation person. And in fact, the so-called white power structure, the oligarchs at that time, who were controlled the sugar plantation, 
hated her. Not just because they had to follow the rule of a Hawaiian, but why else did they hate her? Because she was a woman. So my point is to understand Hawaiians have always been progressive in regards to the role of women in politics. Okay. 1893, the act of war, and again, th those words are, are stated by President Cleveland in his address to Congress, which talked about the landing of the 187 U.S. Marines off the USS Boston on January 16, 1893, as an act of war. And, uh, and his own words, a military occupation of Honolulu. I repeat, military occupation of Honolulu. So when people get nervous and they say, who is Hawaiians talking about this military occupation going on? It's nothing new. Those are the same, those are the words that were spouted by the U.S. president himself. And you can go look it up. Go look at Cleveland's address to Congress in 1893. Okay, and uh, this is her words in, in January of um, 17, 1893. Um, so when you think about some of the political struggling that's going on in Hawaii to this day, a lot of it goes back to her, her words here. And I'm, I'm just going to jump to the second part, as you can see. She says, now to avoid any collision of armed forces and perhaps the loss of life, I do this under protest and impelled by said force, yield my authority. Now, what did she yield? Be clear about that. Because there's a mythology, though. She gave up the land. She gave up the country. She, she only has power to yield what? Her constitutional power, which was her, that was it. It's as if Biden could give away the United States to, you know, the Russians or something. Of course, it doesn't have the power to do that in the same way. But the mythology, see, Hawaii's, uh, um, the destruction of Hawaii and Hawaiian people has been based upon these mythologies. And that's why for me it's a very important element is to uncover these mythologies and challenge those mythologies and destroy these mythologies. And so, <clears throat> and look what she also says. Until such time, what does that mean, until such time? Forever? It was always provisional and temporary. All you got to do is read. As the government of the United States shall, upon facts being presented to it, undo the actions of its representatives and reinstate me in the authority. She doesn't say, give me back my country. She doesn't say, give me back. She doesn't even mention the lands. It has nothing to do with the title of the lands. See, that's the mythology, which I claim as the constitutional sovereign. Okay, sorry, go ahead. And... 1893, the provisional government takes over, followed by 1894, by the Republic of Hawaii. Hawaiians in 1897 launch a huge organizing effort to stop the so-called attempt of an annexation of, I go to the word attempt, because let's be clear. In 1897, that was a second formal attempt by the powers to be, especially those who were being pushed by the U.S. military in Hawaii, to officially annex the Hawaiian Islands. They failed for a second time, I repeat. In 1897, the United States Senate fails to ratify by two-thirds supermajority, as stated by the United States Constitution, Article 2, Section 2, to ratify, and the Treaty of Annexation fails. So there is a mythology that somehow that there is a Treaty of Annexation that occurred. And maybe if you look up Wikipedia, you might see something. I don't know, but... Let me just say this, as I tell my students every semester, if you can show me the treaty, you got an A for every single class you can take for me in the future. Because there is none. That's a mythology. There's more truth in Mickey Mouse at Disneyland, because I can see Mickey Mouse when I go to Disneyland. I can see no annexation of the Hawaiian Islands. That is a fact. And the reason why it failed was because of the so-called petition. 38,000 signatures were gathered by, from Native Hawaiians, submitted on the Senate floor to show there is no consent to the so-called Hawaii being taken. And that's why it fails. 1898, the United States, they're getting ready for it. They got to get Hawaii. In fact, they just had war in March of 1898 in uh, the Battle of Manila, a naval battle. And so in order to push this agenda, they passed what's called a resolution, a public law, 
resolution. Many of you should know your resolution. What does a re what kind of power does a well, what kind of res what kind of power does a resolution have in the Maui County? Does it work on Kauai? So how does the U.S. resolution have any effect extraterritorial outside of the United States in another country? It doesn't. The United States has no effect in Canada. It doesn't have effect in New Zealand. And this becomes the crux of the matter when you look at the so-called legal status of the Hawaiian Islands. Good. And so from that point on, the United States increases their military hugely in the Hawaiian Islands during the Spanish-American War. I mean, they will tenfold the amount of military personnel in Hawaii. And of course, that builds itself all the way to later on to World War II. Hawaii has always been the military outpost to protect the so-called interests of the United States, of those people from California and beyond. The question of the ceded lands has always been the question. Much of the lands, in fact, are the most important and valuable water lands. In fact, if you go to East Maui, all of those lands are these lands. 43% of the Hawaiian Islands, 1.8 million acres. Sorry. Hawaiian homelands, 1921, is packed ex exclusively yeah, for rehabilitation of so-called Native Hawaiians. 50% blood quantum copying off of the Homestead Act with American Indians is then imposed on Native Hawaiians. When Hawaiians were actually asked to force and said, you got to give us a blood quantum, you know what the Hawaiians submitted? 132nd. That consciousness has been an imposition upon our people. In fact, you can look 1920. In fact, I, I need to say, because I think these lands right here, in fact, are Hawaiian homelands. I'm pretty sure. In fact, somebody maybe go check and go find out. These lands we're standing right here were originally Hawaiian homelands. Because all Waiahuli coming down, Keo Kea. <clears throat> you can see on the left, that's Lua Lua Lei, Naval Magazine on Oahu, that's Hawaiian homelands. That's Sea Life Park. The Wolfen is living on Hawaiian homelands. And on right, that's Pohakuloa, the largest live farm military training spot in the Pacific. That's Hawaiian homelands, where the US military pays the Hawaiian homelands a dollar a year to blow up and poison our lands. Okay. Sorry, here you go. Across 1959, so called statehood, which again, another. The question, of course, where does this, where does the so-called legal power of even this question uh, has, has this one? But anyway, I don't have time to go through all of this, this question, but one of the things I want to recognize, though, is 1.4 million acres of land. Hawaiian Constitution, yeah, just to kind of recognize those, those numbers. Okay, go ahead, sorry. Hawaii State Constitution, and some of the things to kind of recognize, even the Hawaii State Constitution has provisions within the Constitution that recognize particular rights through policies, and whether it's Hawaiian language, whether it's education, um, check out, sorry, there's a, next one, sorry, yeah, sorry, next one, sorry, okay. let me stop right here. So we think about, Mary talked about issues of access and gathering. And so even within the so-called state constitution, of course, these questions have been brought up. See, a lot of people don't realize that much of the system, the legal system we have today, is not something new. It's based on, it's, it's basically, that's why Hawaii revised statutes. What was revised? If you go to the courthouse, second circuit court, go walk into, if I see lawyers, go walk in a second, go look in the walls of the judges. Why does it start with the Hawaiian kingdom? It's still the same second circuit court. The court never changed. In fact, the basis for it, they still look at laws during the Hawaiian kingdom as precedents. How come? See, and this is the kind of things you kind of got to recognize. So even Hawaii State Constitution, when they set up uh, the question of access and rights of the so-called hoa aina upon the lands, recognize that Hawaiians had traditional customary Hawaiian rights. And eventually, even um, in 1995, the past this, what's called the Pash decision, uh, the Supreme Court, head Supreme Court Justice uh, Richardson, I think he's on the next one, sorry, go to the next one. Oh, sorry. Go back again. But I think that's his quote on the bottom. With respect of, to developing, and so this is important for Kihei. It's important for Kihei. A lot of development still going on. A lot more planned. It says here, with respect to developing lands, the developer's private property interest is what? Subject to what? 
superior rights, a superior mean. Is superior and is inferior. So when Hawaiians got to beg for something that's already guaranteed, you see, this is why we get struggle. Established by customary and traditional. Part of the issues that we have in Hawaii, there's been neglect of many of those powerful elite with money to pretend to hire lawyers who can pretend. I've been with lawyers and I show them to their faces. They go, yeah, that's correct, Kalikwa. You're exactly right, but how do you get the court to recognize that? So again, that's another political issue. It has nothing to do with the truth. And I myself, as a professor, I'm not bound by so-called legal, you know, legalese kind of stuff. I'm bound by academics and citing your sources and showing your primary evidence. Not only that, it's just mythology. Hey, sorry. Wait. I just, I just, yeah. But it leads us to these kinds of struggles today, yeah, whether it's Malama Aina, the caring for our land. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't want time to go to. Again, like I even talked about annexation. You know, this is nothing that radical Hawaiians are making up, that even the UN <laughs> understand these kinds of questions. Sorry, go on. The idea of even the word occupation, you can find it in many, many of the publications, the books. You can look at some of the top so-called uh, international law, uh, you, know, um, so, you know, academic scholars that you can find out there, and they're saying much of the same thing that you can find. Yeah. 1999, you know, Hawaiians actually make it all the way to the, um, uh, the Hague. So yes, Hawaiians have already expanded into the so-called international level, sorry. <clears throat> but it's the Declaration of Rights. Sorry, I don't have time to go through all about this stuff, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, let me stop right there. An interesting thing, I was, <clears throat> I was sitting with uh, Justice Klein once, um, former justice, uh, Hawaii Supreme Court, um, and had to explain to him that his argument as he was trying to explain that somehow about the legal status of where the United States gets the legal status to be President Hawaii. Where does it come from? And I asked him, where, where does it come from? And he talked about the annexation, he talked about, I said, oh really? Well, let me go show you CAMEX. This was in 19, um, was it 89? So, <clears throat> there was a crisis off of what we call Taiwan today, and the question was what kind of powers the United States have extraterritorial? And as they were investigating, and the, um, uh, <clears throat> the legal counsel, the Department of Justice was investigating this, they, and you can find this on the web, you can go look, look at it yourself, yeah? Don't, don't trust anything I'm saying. Again, find it for yourself. You should know for yourself. And um, when he does this thorough investigation to figure out, well, how does the United States have power, legal power in Hawaii? What did he find? Well, you can read part of his quote says, it is therefore unclear <laughs> with constitutional power Congress exercised when it acquired Hawaii by joint resolution. Accordingly, it is doubtful that the acquisition of Hawaii, my point is, there is no evidence. Even their top guys could not find anything. So this question over the legality of United States law being imposed in Hawaii has always been at the forefront of much of the kinds of struggles that you hear today in Hawaii. Sorry, go ahead. We can look at recent letters. This is uh, Alfred Desaius, 2018. You can find this on the web also. Okay, as you can see, try to go back, sorry, just to be clear. You can see, United Nations, this was actually purposely put on letterhead. UN letterhead, in fact, was a week before he left. But he purposely put it on UN letterhead. Not as an opinion, but as a person who held that particular office of High Commissioner for Human Rights. Sorry, and you can read, he says, as a professor of international law, UN independent expert, okay, sorry, and he says, I have come to understand that the lawful political status of the Hawaiian Islands is that of a sovereign nation state in continuity. That is from a legal international law expert. Not a professor at UH Maui College, not Uncle Kimo on it, you know, Kamoli Tree perhaps. My point is, what you hear going on in Hawaii is nothing less, nothing more, that's what's being talked about in the rest of the world. 
and you can either close your eyes, you can pretend, you can hide, but the truth is, it's moving. Sorry. <clears throat> he also said, in order to exercise the rights protected under international law, be a matter of Hawaiian kingdom law, international, not domestic U.S. law. So we talk about land titles again, we talk about access and gathering, we talk about water rights. These are issues that I hope and pray will shake every single land speculator in these islands. And I say that straight up. Sorry, I don't have time to put it down. I mean, yeah, I don't have, sorry. Yeah. Usually I talk about some of these other issues. I think there's some stuff with key eggs. Sorry, go ahead, Sorry. I think I put something. Oh. Oh, that was it? Oh, I must have forgot. Anyway, some of the other things I just want to talk about, especially in these islands that I've been involved with specifically, of course, has, I mean, in this side, has been issues, of course, land titles, access and gathering, rights to, um, access religious and cultural and spiritually um, important places and spaces, rights to education, uh, whether it's the use of insecticides and pesticides and, and the destruction of our lands and waters, on even our own lands. I mean, I'm talking lands that belong to our people. You know, these are issues that I believe are, when you think about... Um, the future of this coastline. When I grew up, and I'm going to talk, when I grew up as a young boy in Kihei, it was actually a nice, small, beautiful farming community. In fact, where I lived, a lot of Hawaiians, where we were, we're, we're, I grew up with a lot of Hawaiians in this south side. You know, the Haro stands where they are, Kalani Cows, the Brewsters, you know. We're all over the place. Small, little town, but it was during our period as kids where Kihei got transformed from a little mango, uh, ye orchard kind of, you know, and onions and that kind of small farming and tomatoes and, and you know, a small dirt road, little Azeka store with a monkey in the back. You know, past Kalama Park was basically almost nothing. There was no Wailea. Makena was basically a dirt road and you kind of needed, well, especially it was raining, four-wheel drive probably just even to get to Big Beach. You know, a lot of, I know a lot of the issues that K has with regards to the water. I mean, we used to play in boats in that place. I mean, every winter it would flood and we used to have tin boats that we would go and you know, like we're in gondolas or something, you know, and, and so for us it's kind of interesting to kind of look back and think the idea that they would even create and develop in those lands was ridiculous. Because we grew up with those lands being wetlands. In fact, all the way to Azekas. Where even Azekas shopping center on the on the Malka side was all wetlands. I tell people they don't realize I remember swimming in the streams where today we call Maui Meadows. Because Maui Meadows would have big rains and the streams would run. It would be nice and blue. This is Maui Meadows I'm talking. So the changes that we've seen in our lifetime, we've seen, so we think about, when people talk about making Kihei better or improving Kihei, it's a very difficult kind of way to think to wrap our minds around because, and not just like, and then you start to talk about a cultural way of living here. But, you know, we all knew one another. We all helped, you know, the fishermen who'd be pulling in the nets down at, you know, across what today we call Kalai Pohaku or Suda store. Um, you know, going down to Lipoa area, Halama Street, the old, uh, well, used to be called the old Kalama Park, the Kwansin Hats across the street. In fact, Foodland wasn't even there when we were little kids. Those little, little small Kwansin huts across the street. So we saw the transformation of Kie go from being this little, nice, close, uh, kind of farming community. And during our period was the great transformation where 
the construction that had gone on during that period was beyond, I think, that we could even imagine. And even myself, after I graduated from Baldwin High School, I later went to Manoa, lived there for a decade or so. And then every time I would come back to Maui, especially seeing this coastline, I was just aghast in the, I don't know a better word I can use, inhumanity that has occurred here. I'm sure some people made a lot of money. I'm sure. Pockets are full. Their selfish lives has been improved. But as a community, I can say that quality of life where the ability to have community is not really present at this time. And so it's one of the questions I had saw was about, you know, how do we make Kihei Hawaiian? Or is Kihei Hawaiian? Well, I can tell you, Chris, they ain't got any Hawaiians. They ain't going to be Hawaiian. Hawaiian isn't something you just spray paint on the side. It's not a decoration. It's not throwing out a few words, singing some songs, putting on some plastic lays. And the confusion of what makes things Hawaiian. When people talk about, oh, there's Hawaiian in the hotels. That has nothing to do with Hawaiians in the hotels. Their shows, their plastic lays, their hospitality. In fact, I hate that word. Hawaiians, you're the host of the, I'm not your, I'm not your host. Don't ever call me your host. I never invited this upon our people. So is there animosity? Yeah. When I was in high school, we thought we were Robin Hood. I'm telling it straight. Because that kind of, with a feeling of the invasion had was so overwhelming. The transformation and change that happened here, out of our control, you know, really destroyed what was here. The question, of course, is more important, right? We can't do nothing about the past, but where are we going to go in the future? And I know this, unless we have a better understanding of the past, a clear understanding of the past, we're really not going to plan for the best in the future. And I know I kind of covered a whole bunch of stuff very quickly, but my point is if anything bothered you, got under your skin, tickled you, you should find out about it. Because the only way we make better decisions about the future is really understanding about what the past was like or else we're going to repeat the same kinds of problems and issues that we had. My parents still live on Noe Street to this day. So I live in Waiahuli, which is Kulauka. So Waiahuli Uka. But this is really the same land space. But my connection to this coast still endures with my parents still living there, which they've lived there since 1970. And in actually talking to my dad earlier, you know, um, a while back, I think for many of the so-called older families in Kie, it's been, a, I mean, I, I, when I look at my Kie brothers and sisters that are still here, man, I honor you guys. Because I know it's tough. It's hard. Not just on the economic level. I think on the social level, how you feel. It's hard to see. It's hard to accept. It's hard to watch. And so the question, of course, what will the future be like? Is it more of this? I mean, that's, the, that's it. That's the question. Is it going to be more of this? What you see? Quasi-California looking, you know, shopping centers after shopping centers after, you know, $5 million homes for those people who don't even live here with their fancy... I don't know, jacuzzis, swimming pools, which I never understood. You get the biggest swimming pool right out there. The first thing it would ban is I'll be all swimming pools in Kie. 
I think it's ludicrous that we even have that going on. See, again, this is my part of the mentality. There are things that can happen, can change if we talk about them. If we understand a little bit about what makes this place special. Because if we continue to go on this path, as I know there are those who do wish it happens that way, the path of the individual or the path of the collective, that's it. There's only two paths. Either it's the we or it's me. That's it. I know that me people try to pretend that they give a little bit of their me to the we. That's part of their own self-pleasuring. The narcissism in themselves to somehow believe that by donating something, they make themselves feel better. But the truth is, homelessness is still on the rise on Maui. And if you don't see the blue tarps, even in places all the way down to La Perouse and Makena, that's just turning a blind eye. But if you don't recognize the ways in which industrial agricultural corporations have been exploiting and destroying our resources through pesticides and insecticides that get and leach into our water systems for corn and other food that we can't even eat here, it's ludicrous. Or we think about driving economies for jobs where you can work 40 hours and still can buy a home or rent a place. Those are the kinds of questions that we must ponder and actually activate on. So I don't, I don't come here to pretend that we're all friends. I'll be straight up. Those who want to continue to exploit our lands and our peoples for their own selfish benefit, the hell with them, that's what I say. And I know sometimes these kind of organizations kind of work with the idea we're all sharing and working together, but I know we're not. Let's be honest. Let's tell the truth. And I'm going to I'll just end by taking my brother Wayne here. He was a young boy. I remember his work even in the county council to make sure and guarantee things like access and gathering and parking to make sure we still to this day can access areas where I grew up in. When I grew up, there was no... Uh, um, Grand Wailea, there was no, you know, Kealani, none of that stuff. That was all prime, well, back then we called camping grounds. Today, that lifestyle, my children will never know. I repeat, my children will never know what it is to be a free Hawaiian by the ocean. Unless I got $10 million. Because when I grew up, that's how we lived. We never lay in the sun catching tan. We fish, we ate, we stayed there for a few days, cleaned up, and they would leave. But that lifestyle, unfortunately, my children will not know. So for me, this is real. Now, can that change? I hope it does. I hope it becomes a day when those kinds of changes occur. And I'm preaching too much, I know, I'm sorry, but Got my chance to say my say here, and I just wanted to, again, just thank everybody for um, speaking, sharing. And as I tell my students, you know, you gotta be honest, that's the first thing. Speak with honesty. You gotta be critical. And you have to challenge ideas, you have to challenge the evidence. And I say criticize, yeah, being critical. And then the last, shit, the last, you gotta be, um, um, oh, shucks, I forget. The third one, which is, you gotta be able to, um, I always said, like, you don't wanna be the devil's advocate. In other words, be sincere. You come here to be sincere. You come here with the idea of making this homeland, this place, this space. You see, I even use the word homeland, because I'm not a visitor here. This is our homeland, making this a better place. So, out of that, mahalo nui, aloha. And 
I, I apologize for when long-winded, but you know. Thank you. I suggest we take a 10-minute uh, break, and then we'll resume with uh, discussing uh, transportation policies. Evening, and uh, could you put up on the screen the uh, the, the 2.1 SMCP policies planning? I don't know what the whole name is the annotated policies. <laughs> it was not testimony. He was an invited speaker. We decided to invite him. You decided. No, no, no. Um, not, could you put up the annotated one that has the uh, the testimony? Thank you. Okay, so we're going to try and get through uh, get through this policy section and maybe possibly start with the actions, but I think that's unlikely today. So the and. As I did before, I, I tried to pull in all the, uh, pardon me? No. Okay, I'm sorry, yes. Yeah, um, right, I'm sorry about that. Okay, so at this point, we will ask for public testimony on the uh, topic for today, which is transportation. Any, any uh, testifiers in the audience on transportation? Uh, Lucien? Mahalo. Uh, my name is Lucien Diné, and I don't live in Kihei, but I've spent a lot of time here. And I did serve on the GPAC, and uh, we considered a, a lot of the transportation issues for Kihei. And I, I think this isn't a mystery, you know. We, we certainly need to look at um, moving the road along Kealia Pond inland. It's in our community plan from 1998. And uh, we just haven't found a way up till this time. Well, we have a new owner now. and. Uh, so that should definitely be on the agenda. Uh, there's been discussion for many years about having an upper road through Kihei uh, to service new developments above Pi'ilani Highway. But uh, I would really urge that we do an honest evaluation of the existing roads and trails. For instance, the Kanayo Kalama Trail starts all the way in Ulapalakua and traverses most of Kihei. It still exists. It is a road, you can see it on Google Earth. Um, uh, Sierra Club uh, advocated for the preservation of a portion of it that goes through Wailea 670. It probably overlaid an older trail. It was improved by the military during World War II, but it's a, it's a very, very important cultural feature, historic feature, and um, it is a, a useful um, feature in terms of uh, looking at how uh, people traveled. Uh, I've been told by um, old timers in, in the Kulakai area that that road existed before the military improved it. So I don't know, Vernon may have some information about this, but um, it, it's an important feature that should not be forgotten. Thank you. Do I have any question from uh, Keoki? Hello, Lucien. Thank you for testifying. Um, being raised in Ma'alai, as you can imagine, um, Kealia is a, a concern of mine and that road that you mentioned. Um, to your knowledge, at, where is that? Like, wh at what, has there been discussions? How far along is that reality? 
Uh, it's in as a concept of the um, adopted community plan that we're living with right now, the 1998 uh, plan. It was discussed at length. Uh, I attended many of those meetings. I'm older than you guys. And I attended many of those meetings, uh, 93, 94, when the community discussed uh, you know, all these same topics. And uh, th that was one, it's a no brainer. You know, it's like the sea is going to come and take back that road eventually. Plus it, it divides a, an important wildlife sanctuary. So in terms of does anyone own any right of way or anything? No. But um, if someone wanted to make that happen, uh, Mahipono is, is far more um, negotiable uh, and, and a little bit quicker to negotiate. It's been the experience of various people in the community. Then A and B, you know, the, the A and B corporate structure had their priorities, but uh, Mahipono has slightly different priorities. So it really is a good time to move that forward in the plan and put some implementing language in that a, a corridor would be identified and the landowners approached, you know, within the next five years. It's, it's like, just, just give there a there there. Yeah, okay, thank you so much. Um, I noticed in the 98 plan there was more firm verbiage than the, the plan now. So we, we revised some, thank you Tovo. Um, for a little bit more stronger words. So, and I, uh, I support that entirely. And that's, right. that's one of the reasons right. I thought, well, you're talking about transportation, that's the elephant in the room. Yes, you know? ma'am. So. I am to definitely in support of that, and I hope everyone else feels the same way. Community, land ownership, right? Otherwise, right. mahalo. Mahalo to you all. Verna. Hey, Lucia, how's it? Oh my. Oh man. It, it's, it's my big time, my first time here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so let's say Mahipono donate the land, or you know, whatever, give up that land mm -hmm. for that backside road inland. Where, where would that money come from? From wherever we can get that money from? First from federal, probably? Well, yeah, there are federal funds with this new Build Back Better. Uh, there are, and, and that, that's for priority infrastructure. And seeing that this kind of dealt, deals with a federal property. Now, the feds do not right. own that property. They have like kind of this lease arrangement with A and B that's like in perpetuity. But they, they have a considerable investment in, in the uh, Kealia Wildlife Refuge. So uh, I would think that federal money, you know, you, you got to hope that our new mayor has some good grant writers and people who are looking for funding for the needs of our community. Certainly, we can put it through our taxes, but if there's other funds available or the county can just provide a 10% match or a 20% match, that just makes fiscal sense. So, you know, we don't have control of that here, but um, let's hope that uh, that a pragmatic approach is, is going to be taken. Okay, and one last question. So. When we're talking about uh, roadways about Pilani Highway, um, to your knowledge, how much of those roadways would be in our district? Well, the, the Kanayo, uh, Kalama Road, it starts in Ulapalakua, uh, and it goes through Wailea 670, it goes through McKenna, resort uh, property, the upper part of McKenna Resort. I was just walking on it not too long ago on a site visit. And it uh, goes through um, uh, Akala Street in Maui Meadows is a continuation of that road. It starts on the other side of Maui Meadows and it continues. It, it crosses Ka Kamoli Gulch. I've walked on many portions of it. Um, uh, it goes behind the high tech center so it's a matter of recognizing it. It's on all the 1950s maps. It's clearly delineated. It's on the 1960s maps. Mm -hmm. uh, I have testified when the High Tech Center got its uh, you know, approvals that it should be recognized and marked. No one would listen, but you know, maybe you guys uh, could be heard a little bit more. Uh, you know, when you have it on a map and you've walked it, you know it's there. You know, let, let's get real here. Okay, well, yeah. Any other clarifying questions? Thank you. Uh, any other testifiers on transportation? Okay, closing public testimony. 
and starting with the, the policies. So as before, I, I tried to capture all the, the testimony that's been provided in written form and uh, put it right next to the, the things that I think uh, they, they apply to. But uh, t testifiers don't make motions, you make motions. So you can choose whether or not to take them into account when, you, when we look at these items. So starting with uh, 2.1.1, which is, is improve South Maui's active transportation network by implementing a multimodal transportation system that includes a bus transit hub and incorporates complete streets, greenways, multi-use paths, and sufficient public transit coverage that allows residents and visitors to move more safely, effectively, and comfortably within South Maui. <coughs> Moved by, uh, by Everett. Second by, by Wayne. Discussion? So I will just say that the, uh, the, 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 the suggestion that Mark, is making, make, Mark Hyde is making here, which is the same with, which was in his, his, his much longer explaining document, um, is that we need to be able to measure these things. In other words, not to say, um, well, I mean, how, how are we going to know what, what, whether we've actually achieved this? So th this is a policy as opposed to an action, but basically my, what Mark is suggesting here is that we should be able to um, me measure the efficiency and the safety of the transportation network. Uh, uh, Would that be the same as having the measurable outcomes? Because I was reading one of the transportation studies and they had, and I think Vernon and I actually sat on that subcommittee um, uh, a while back, and so I was rereading it. It's available on the website, but it talked about the measurable outcomes, so I would support that. So, again, uh, um, I'm not making a motion, and uh, Mark can't make a motion, so if someone would like to add that text in, they have to make that motion. Otherwise, we'll just move on. And that would be to the 2.1.1. Yes. And then um, the recommendation to make that motion to add on, I don't know if I'm going to get the verbiage correctly, but having um, measurable outcomes. Um, could that just be at the tail end? I think it could, within South Maui, with measurable outcomes. Yeah, so I'd like to propose that. Second by, by Brian. Um, do you accept that as, as a... Uh, Friendly amendment? Yes. And Wayne, you accept that? Okay. okay. Further discussion? Any objections? I find we have adopted uh, 2.101. Um, and then the, the next two are with the strike throughs, I think we can just uh, ignore because those are the ones that the planning department feels are not really relevant here. Um, we have another, just I want to point this out because. We're not, we're changing them to actions, right? yeah. No, this is policies. Yeah, I know, but I'm saying we're not saying that they're not relevant. We're saying that we've moved them into the action, so they're in the action. The, so, um, and. I just, I'll just leave it out there for just half a minute to see if anyone wants to say, do anything or say anything about the two suggestions by Mark Hyde here. <clears throat> and if not, then I'll just move on to 2.1.4. Establish safe routes interconnecting South Maui. Safe routes are primarily street networks that safely accommodate pedestrians and bicyclists of all ages to get from homes to schools, parks, and beaches shops, jobs, and other services. Moved by, moved by Everett, seconded by Wayne. Discussion? Any objections? Okay, I find that, that we have adopted 2.1.4. Uh, 2.1.5. Support the extension of a continuous bike lane along Makena Alanui and Makena Road, providing cyclists safe access to Makena State Park. And various points here, what I've done is I've inserted language from 
from the Kihei Makena Community Plan from 1998, just as, as kind of a, a framing. <clears throat> it had more ambitious plan. It had more ambitious goals, namely than what we what we have in front of us right now. <clears throat> Um, so again, 2.1.5. Um, do we have a motion for that? Yes. We didn't, okay. Uh, okay, um, for the discussion, 2.1.5, uh, any objections? Sorry, I didn't hear a second or a motion. I did not either. For this one? Oh, okay, yes. They did, they did for 2 to 1 to 5 as well, yes. And Wayne, yes. Any objections to 2 to 1 to 5? And we've adopted 2 to 1 to 5. 2 to 1 to 6, incorporate the principles of complete streets for all new roadways and roadway expansion and improvement projects. By Everett. Seconded by Wayne. Discussion? I'm glad these things are not controversial. These, these are really good things. Really, they make a, if, if we had known about and implemented these things 30 years ago, what a difference we, we'd have today. Okay, um, any, uh, can, any objections to 2.1.6? I find we have adopted 2.1.6. Testing. <laughs> Uh, I just had a, a clarification question. What exactly is the definition of a complete street? So, so a complete street is um, a street that provides for multimodal types of uses. So it could be for cars, it could be for pedestrians, it could be for bicyclists. So it's, it's in that it provides mobility in different ways. So the north-south collector would be what a complete street could kind of, is what the ideal is because it allows for cars, it allows for bicycles, it allows for pedestrians and they're safe and they're green and they have trees and they have grass and they're, they're wonderful. It could include a sidewalk. Um, it's just, it's, it's allowing for not just a road. It's the idea that we've, we've turned into providing for different types of tra transportation options along, along a road. Like Liloa, exactly, yeah. yeah. Liloa between Waipuilani and, and, uh, um, and PK, uh, that's, that's kind of an ideal. That's, that's the only one we have at this point. <laughs> Hopefully we'll have more. Okay, um, do we, we have a, a motion on that one? 2.1.6? We did. Okay. And I think we actually adopted it. That's right. Okay, we're on to 2.1.7. Require and undertake transportation system improvements prior to or concurrently with the growth of the South Maui region. Roadway improvements should be planned, designed, and constructed as generally described in the Kihei Sub-Area Transportation Plan. <clears throat> Moved by Everett. Second. Second by Wayne. We have a team here. Yeah. I, I, I made this note here just because it's, this is kind of important to me. If you look at the Kihei McKenna Community Plan, it says plan, design, and construct. No, I'm sorry. It says no further development unless infrastructure, public facilities, and services needed to service new development are available prior to or concurrent with impacts of new development. 
And not only did it say that, it says that in eight places. And I found one other thing that's named, mentioned twice, that's all. So the people who worked on the Key McKinley Community Plan, they, they thought this was pretty darn important. Uh, and also I think the reason, another reason they put it in, in, eight, in eight times is they, they wanted to be sure that it got noted and taken into account. And I think the reason we're putting it in again is because we don't think it has been taken into account, but it really needs to. So, uh, discussion. Brian? Um, I would suggest that we don't, that we add or future such plans, so we don't limit it to that if there is a different plan that is introduced that we're not locked into just the uh, Kihei sub area transportation plan. Friendly amendment accepted. And then I do have a question just around the bus plans. My understanding is they currently end at the uh, Kilohana. Is, do we need to take into account if we're talking about workforce housing? If we wanted to have that in Wale and McKenna, don't we need to make sure that the plan is inclusive to be able to permit that? Otherwise, we're not going to be able to do workforce housing based on what we've talked about previously. I didn't quite get that. Is that is that a suggestion to change two to one point seven? I'm asking a question just on what the, the bus plan would be, because from what I've understood, it doesn't go past Kilohana. I just want to make sure that we're building. If we're in a great policy, I want to make sure that we're supporting what the policies that we wrote before, which was we want to support workforce housing in the Wailea area. So if the plans aren't there to support that we wrote a policy that we can't actually then put in place. So I, I don't know the answer, that's why I'm asking the question. I don't know if this would make you feel a little better, but the last part of that sentence is constructed as generally described. So it, it wouldn't restrict the department looking just at that generally but if you want to make it broader, you could. Is that your question, Brian? Am I, am I understanding that? I guess I would look to others for their thoughts. I just want to make sure that the policies that we've written, that we're supporting them, that we're not writing something that's contrary, that doesn't let that be able to be facilitated. So I think you're asking if, if we're restricting it to a geographical area which is smaller than our actual responsibility, right? Correct. Like what? So what if um, uh, the part uh, requiring undertake transportation system improvements prior to a uh, concurrently with the growth of the South Maui region, wouldn't that encompass the entire region? Would that suffice? Yeah. Yeah, I turned it off you. <laughs> yes. I didn't quite get that. Was that, is that a change or is it just? No, no, I, just, I'm just reading it. Just reading it, okay. Because, um, you know, when you read it out loud, it sounds better, but um, just because the South Maui region encompasses everything, including the Kilohana and any additional, so that would, you know, um, to advocate for what Brian is saying, um, and yep. the planning department can confirm if that is indeed correct, that it would encompass all areas. Um, so I just wanted to support what you're saying Thanks. by rereading that. Okay, no, no, with that clarification, that makes sense. I just want to make sure that we're, we're supporting what we're asking to get built, because Otherwise, we're contradicting ourselves. And I agree with you. Yeah. More, more discussion? Any objections to the, uh, as written, 2.1.7? Microphones are complicated. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I had proposed that we add or f future such plans, and I think Everett accepted that. Yes, correct. That is correct. That, that is the, the motion, yes. Any objections to, I'm sorry, any objections to the motion as amended? <laughs> I find we have adopted 2.1.7 with, uh, with the amendment. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
And again, I'll just skip back, skip past Mark's proposal unless someone wants to pick it up. Two point one point nine require new development, redevelopment, and housing projects developed pursuant to Chapter two hundred one H, Hawaii Revised Statutes, and Chapters two point nine six and two point nine seven, Maui County Code housing projects to include facilities and programs that support connectivity biking, walking, and public transit, whether constructed by the developer, the county, or state, or public-private partnerships. Moved by, moved by Everett, seconded by Wayne. <clears throat> Discussion? Any objections to 2.19 as, as proposed? And we've adopted 2.1.9. 2.1.10. So I just I just made one little note. I, I'll read it first. Require development projects Mauka of Pete Lani Highway to coordinate with the county and state on implementing a new multimodal transportation corridor spanning through South Maui to Central Maui, Mauka of Pete Lani Highway as identified in action 1.14. So currently that should be 1.13, but of course that could change over time as we add other things, so I won't worry too much about that. So another just a little clarifying thing. So some, sometimes people mix things up, but this this is about a, a, a highway which is parallel to Pete Lani Highway, and up, a Mauka Highway parallel to. Some in other places, there has been discussion of a highway that goes from Kihei to Pukalani, for example. That's not this. Uh, Wait, would that parallel uh, highway be in our district or be in the other guy's district? <laughs> yeah. That's a very good question. I should have looked that up. <laughs> if it's in their district, let's just do it. Yeah. See what happened when we cut Malka to Makai, right? <laughs> Use your microphone, please. I move that we approve uh, 2.1.10 with the only change being change 1.14 uh, to 1.13. Motion by Everett, second by Brian. This one was also in the, uh, actually it, it says it right here, it was in the Kihei McKenna Community Plan. Yeah, actually the Kihei McKenna Community Plan, Kihei McKenna Community Plan had all three of them in one, <laughs> in one policy, that's pretty bold. Okay, discussion on 2.1.10. Since someone's saying anything, and since we're moving along pretty quickly, I'll just say a few words there. I am not someone who loves building new roads, not at all. I'd rather see fewer cars and, and less traffic, another way for people to get around. And, and we'll, we, we have some of that, and we'll be getting to more of that in the policies and the actions. But unfortunately, we already have a, a way too many cars, way too much traffic. And we already have so much additional development planned that I don't see any way around having a, an additional bypass there especially with South Kihei, going, uh, Kihei Road going away and uh, North-South Collector Road not being complete. I think we, unfortunately, I think we'll need this. And uh, it won't happen soon. I mean, this is like, you know, 20 years, I, was, I would think, at absolutely best case, would be my guess. Discussion? Any objections to 2.1.10 with the change to uh, action 1.13? I find we have adopted 2.1.10 with that amendment. Yes, Tova? 
sorry, slow in the uptake here, but before we move on from this page, I'm wondering if we can revisit some of the suggestions that came in from Mark. This idea of not having more Malka development directly coming off Pi'ilani Highway and having the setback, to me, seems like a good idea. So I would like to propose that. Um, so these, this was language that was inserted between 2.1.7 and 2.1.2. Uh, That's a motion. It's sort of a messy motion. <laughs> so everybody got that? Re require all property Moka Pete Lani Highway to be developed with a 150 foot landscape setback. Is that the one or is it, no, it's the one? Yeah, no, that one and also just uh, not having more developments immediately off Pete Lani Highway. I think there's yeah. wisdom if our whole point is to make it so cars can move, don't make it so you can pull off endlessly, or we're gonna end up with more of what we're trying to avoid. So I think those two together seem reasonable. Just, just clarification, are you saying no more curb cuts, no more intersections, as opposed to uh, development, you just I believe you're saying no more intersections so that the traffic continues to flow? I don't know. Is that what I'm saying? I think we should. I think we should do those things as separate items. Because, okay. I mean the, um, the setback and then the, the the traffic part or the, the the interconnections part. So if we, if we do this one, and that's my proposal anyway. So, so the first one. So I'm just reading out Mark's text, but again, it's up to you guys to make a motion on one way or the other. Mark suggests restrict all future access. This is how he thinks he'll, he, we could possibly solve this problem. Restrict all future access to Pi'ilani Highway to dedicated streets and roads. Prohibit driveway access, including but not limited to right-hand turn lanes into driveways or left turn lanes from driveways. Uh, Everett? I'm trying to think if there are, I can't, I'm trying to think of driveways off Pi'ilani Highway. I can't think of any. He wants to avoid them. It's a state highway. You can't have them. Oh, you can't have them. <laughs> okay. Not much of a highway, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. So you're saying that this is not relevant because it's okay. That doesn't mean someone can make a motion, but that's advice from Everett. Uh, Mark, uh, Mike. And just on this issue, the, the general question is, does the state government have to abide by our, um, our community plan? Uh, I know a, uh, a director of the state uh, uh, Department of Transportation when at a, at a public meeting when someone said to him about what's in the community plan, he just said, I don't care about that. that I don't have to abide by that. I'm the state. And that was one man speaking, but nobody contradicted him. So I wonder sometimes that we're trying to do all this, and does this, is the state obligated to abide by the community plan? It doesn't seem so to me. Just something to consider. I don't think this is directed towards the state. This is directed towards the planning department. They shouldn't grant uh, permits to build build along the highway in such a way that they have driveway access. And, uh, but if that's not possible anyway, then. I, I, thought the, um, I thought the motion was not to have any more. I, uh, when I first heard it, I thought um, it was not to have any more streets, any more intersections off Pialani Highway, which I think would be a good thing to avoid just to keep traffic moving. You know, the less intersections you have, the less stoplights you have. Um. I think that's what I thought I was referring to too. And now I can't figure out in which of these gazillion lines of things I was referring to that. Um. I, I think we're covered because it's a state highway and um, so. And if that's the case, then great. Yep. 
So if it's a state highway, how about the second part of requiring all property Malco at Pilani Highway to be developed 150 feet landscape setback? That would fall into county, right? Um, so I would like to put that forward as a motion. Is there a second? Only thing I'd raise there is it just creates more sprawl and it's, it's harder to walk places. It's, you know, I think the more condensed we are, the less infrastructure we're, we as taxpayers are paying to expand and the easier it is for kids to walk around and get to shops and school and, um, so, I mean, I just, you know, I'm not speaking in opposition. I'm just making, you know, just sharing that. Right. Yeah, I think it's a good point. I think in the longer version of the testimony, there is the example of the Tesoro store corner, which isn't Tesoro anymore. I forget what it's called now. And that's brought up again and again as like that ugly example <laughs> of having a bunch of commercial things right on the street. Um, and I'm always going to be a fan of people walking another 150 feet anywhere because it's good for you. But <laughs> I hear your point. I'd still like to put it forward as a motion. Is, is there a second? Second by Kyoki. More discussion? I'll just read it one more time just so everyone knows what we're, we're voting on here. Require all property Mooka of P. Lani Highway to, to be developed with a 150 foot landscape setback, obscuring development from highway view. Any objections? This is a new, new text. So it's, it's right under 2.1.7. Any objections? I find we have adopted uh, this, this additional item. Let's do a couple more and then we can take a break. Um, can I just ask a quick question? Everett, you had mentioned not having additional intersections and stuff off the Pialani. Are you saying that that's not something that we have to worry about or should we be making a motion? Because I would support that. I was, um, initially I was referring to driveways. You can't, we can't have any driveways. That's, right. um, that can't be done. Um, intersections, I mean, there's a lot of property from the police station towards um, uh, Maui Meadows. So there's a lot of property, Malcove there, that will probably one day be developed um, and they're gonna have to get to it. I mean, there'll you know, probably be intersections. That maybe we say, you know, since it hasn't been developed, there's plenty of land area for additional roundabouts. I'm just thinking just less stoplights, less, right. you know. So maybe we say no more um, uh, intersections, uh, no more stoplights, no more stoplights. Because there will be additional uh, intersections on, you know, roads coming Malka to the Pialani Highway. So maybe we just say no more stoplights. Just roundabouts. If, if roundabouts work, if it's not the land's <laughs> not developed, you've got plenty of land area to construct a roundabout in. Right. They, t they take a lot of space. But I was really impressed with the uh, the northbound. I mean, the southbound traffic today. It was moving. It was moving fast. It was, and there were no accidents, and everyone got it. It was really impressive. So, is that is that a motion or what? I'll second. That, that's not here. That's something new. Require all future um, access points on Pialani Highway to be accessed through via roundabouts as opposed to T, inter, T intersections. Now second. Second by Brian. Discussion? Uh, Mike? Well, 
I completely support the idea, but then that brings me back to, isn't the state going to make that decision? It's, it's on a state highway. Aren't they going to decide what is going to be at the uh, intersection? Mike, you're right. What if we say encourage instead of require? No. Again, I, I totally support it, but I just don't want to, if we're just wishful thinking, saying, well, this is what we're requiring, and the state's going to say, tough. But, but Mike, wouldn't it be better to have it in, and then if the state says, too bad, at least we have it there, so that we can at least have a position versus not having a position? Well, there's two ways to look at it. One way is we see we have all these things in the current community plan that are just ignored. So are we putting things in just as wishful thinking? Uh, if they're not, uh, even the things that we have in here which should be happening aren't happening. So we, is it too much of a stretch? I have no objection to putting it in, but I'm just voicing that, that um, I see that, that it might just be wishful thinking. But I, I, would, I would support it if the group wants to go with it. Has a comment, ever? So we, we just, um, instead of saying require, encourage all future access points along PLN and Highway to be accessed via roundabouts as opposed to T intersections. And they accept that? Yeah. Okay, seconded by Brian. Any further discussion? Any objections? Finally, we have added this new, this new uh, policy. Was there anything more uh, to what we wanted to do before we go on to the next page? Not at this time, thanks. Okay. Did we? So we're at 2.1.11? That's correct. Okay. Um, yeah, and again, I, I just wanted to point out that um, for this Mark's text here, which is at the bottom of the first page, that's a very, very specific way to, to measure the quality of, of uh, traffic, the quality of transportation. Um, and I think that is something we need because if we say no, no more development on the, until there's sufficient infrastructure, sufficient uh, streets, for example, what does that mean? And so this is, this is one way to measure it. Even maybe or maybe not, it's the right way. Um, But if no one wants to act on those things, we'll just move on to 2.1.11. Okay, 2.1.11. Support the completion of the planned north-south collector road and adjacent multi-use path that will improve travel through Kihei and provide access to additional routes for emergency ingress and egress. And again, this was, this was in the Kihei McKenna Community Plan as well. Chair. Uh, yes. Oh, Kavika. Planning Department is recommending that we add the words where feasible after completion. OK, that's a suggestion. <laughs> So uh, we need a motion, and uh, that, could, that could be adopted as a friendly amendment. I move that we um, approve it with the planning department's uh, revision where feasible, because a lot of that's already been developed. I think um, I don't really understand, though, and provide access to additional routes for emergency ingress and egress. I mean, this is, to me, this is probably the, my biggest hope for the um, transportation section is to complete the North-South Collector Road. We built part of it when we built Kamali Elementary School, and it leads to nowhere. I think that this, the, the intent of the language is that it is the completion of the road that will provide access to additional routes for emergency ingress and egress. Yeah. Make the motion. 
we're, we're fee adding the language where feasible after completion. Yep. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Brian. Um, I would actually suggest that we change support to actually be required. Um, it's one of the things we've heard testimony about that this is a big problem. So why, in other conversations we're talking about strong language, if this is such a big issue for so many people, which I think it is, why would we not want this to be required? To me, this is like the number one thing. If I could pick one thing for the county of Maui to spend money on in right. South Maui, this would be it. And I guess that's my point of like, it, it, from just listening to testimony and, and the challenges, to me, this is where required, it, this is where I would want it to be required. So we fix the problem. To the best, for best friend, we can. Friendly amendment. Okay, accepted. There, there, there will be some more discussion. This is fine, but there will be some more discussion about this. We get the actions too. So it's not over. Uh, further discussion? Any objections to the amended motion? Require and then completion where feasible. And motion passes 2.1.11 with those amendments. Let's do one more and then we'll take a break, okay? Um, okay, next one's a ch change of pace here. 2.1.13, support the integration of wetlands and drainage ways with greenways and multi-use paths in and around the Lipoa Business District. I have a question for Cody on this one. Cody, would that degrade in any way the wetlands to have the um, greenways and multi-use paths? In other words, having the sidewalks or cinder pathways, is that, would that in any way harm the wetlands or would you prefer for it not, what, what's, your, what's your recommendation? Yeah, I was kind of looking at that as well. Um, I think it would depend on where, where that was. Um, I feel like right now we're still gathering a lot of data on our wetlands and um, mapping them out and understanding them and um, this could be something maybe in the future but I would say right now um, I would rather try and keep those greenways maybe away from the wetlands. But that's my opinion. In that case, I recommend that we delete 2.1.13. Cody, right. if, if I could ask a question. Is, is there a study going on right now that if we amended that to say, keep basically keep that, but post the results of us? Is there like a formal study or is it more just in, a, a more informal? Well, we're still kind of understanding our drainage and everything like that. I mean, even with our the Mulivaya that is emptying out into our area, we're still understanding the drainage and the data. Um, I would say not right now. You know, maybe maybe down the line when we have a better understanding of um, our drainage and our understanding of um, when we map out the wetlands and everything like that, and have a better idea of where they all are. Um, and how that um, supports our infrastructure, then, then we could revisit the topic again. And, and I guess the reason I ask is that this goes back to our desire to have workforce housing, and it kind of ties into having the greenways being close to businesses and stuff like that. Right. So I, would, I guess my thought is I'd be concerned of pulling it out because that's part of what we want to have to be able to put the housing in. So is there something that we could add to say that once 
an appropriate study or evaluation or understanding. I, I, and I don't know what that would involve, so I'd have to defer to you. But I, I would be concerned taking it out because that kind of goes against what we're stating needs to be in place to put in the housing. But I, but I hear what you're saying, that we're not really ready, so I'm not sure how to weave those two together. I wouldn't really know how to word it, but I would rather wait until we get more data um, and do more of the mapping of the wetlands and everything like that. So would it be appropriate to say that we post the mapping of the wetlands, like putting in the, that kind of language? Am I making sense? <laughs> The, the so I'm sorry. Um, I have interpretation and maybe what I'm understanding from both sides. Um, but I think this one is only specific for the Lipoa Business District, yeah? Because right. it says it, so no place else, yeah? But in terms of what Cody is saying and um, the possibility, I, I'm just going to reword it, uh, maybe um, saying to support the study of integrating the wetlands and drainage ways with the possibility um, of having greenways and multi-use paths in and around the Lipo Business District. The only reason I would put that in is because there would be an emphasis on completing a study, and if it, the study says no, yep. then it's no. And that was my so that, that was exactly my point, yeah. that by taking it out, just immediately taking it out, we restrict ourselves, but if mm -hmm. the study is there and it says okay, mm -hmm. then we're actually supporting what we've been putting in for other policies, but if the study says no, then the answer would be no. Yeah, and so that way we can make sure we're putting on an emphasis on, um, like Cody's saying, we're still looking into it and so forth. And so I think that's extremely important that we're yep. respecting the process. But um, stating it and clarifying what it is, I think is important. So in support of what um, you're saying, if it's OK to put it in, um, that would be my suggestion. I, I skipped over KOK, okay. sorry. Um, no, thank you. I'm just listening because I'm kind of flowing in the direction of where Brian is going and then also what Lehua was saying. So my question to Cody is, um, do you feel it more beneficial to support Everett's move to strike it or reword it to benefit the fact that there is a study going and whether or not this study will provide it even being feasible to integrate it or not at all? As long as it's mentioned and reworded, um, maybe it might support the cause better as far as leaving it alone or, you know, some way integrating. Yeah, I would say um, we, you know, go along with the study. And um, depending on what the study says, then we can revisit it again. My whole thing is that um, I've seen so much um, uh, deteriorating within the, our, our wetlands because of human contact, right? And the, the, um, the value in the wetlands is we basically just kind of let it do its thing and, and leave it alone, you know? Um, the more contact we have with it, I feel like the more um, detrimental it becomes. But um, being that it does align with uh, the Greenway and that there is a study going on, I would say, you know, let the study uh, determine what areas is um, considered wetlands and um, we can revisit it again. That's my take on it. Sure. Okay, thank you, um, Cody, for your manau. I agree 100% that it's, it's rare that you can even touch a wetland and not detriment it. I mean, this isn't even like a topic, but so instead of getting rid of this, can we rearrange the language to just, you know, say not to interfere. I mean, studies or not, they're going to show what you've just said. Um, yeah. Like I said, it's, it's, it's rare, if even that, 
to not detriment a wetland by touching it. A wetland was created by nature in its ebb and flow. Right. And so anytime we mess with it, there's, a, there's an effect, right? A cause and an effect, and it's usually detrimental. So rather than get rid of this, would you like to just, you know, not support any of that near the wetlands of the Poa Business District? That would probably be beneficial to yeah, help yeah. in that wetland area. Yeah, I cut all that. Um, yeah. No matter what the, um, the study is going to show, it's still very important to not have too much contact with our wetlands. But um, so, like maybe um, not supporting the integration of the wetland and you know the, the multi-use paths. Multi-use paths must avoid. Well, I'm thinking about like the drainage. Yeah. Yeah. If we're creating um, greenways, yeah, it's and we don't, and we're still kind of determining where these where the drainage is and how that's gonna affect, affect the wetlands. It. Yeah. Um, how are we gonna How are we gonna um, Right. Should Should we be saying Yeah, let's build. Let's have that right at this moment. You know. So. I would just think that. Um, would it be beneficial for a more specifically worded right, right. policy that would support what um, we're trying to protect here rather than get rid of it altogether? Food for thought. Do you guys? I think Tova, you had your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Um, I like Lehua's suggestion of having it be study based. Uh, there's always the risk that things are, are loved to death, and I think that's what you're speaking to. But there's also a way to do things and a way to not do things, and drainage ways are different than wetlands, and there are lots of examples, even some here in Maui, even some in our area, where uh, boardwalks have been integrated into wetlands in a way that bring awareness, they bring people's connection to the place in a way that we want to have, because then they're going to be supportive of it. So I. I like the idea of at least studying it and giving it a chance. Of course, if it was having a negative impact, it would be ruled out at that time. But um, it's an opportunity to bring awareness for this issue that's so key <laughs> here in Kihei. So devil's advocating you there. Uh, Verna? Yeah, um, uh, we should keep them. And then... And... Uh, um, because it, the, the the study, the data, the, the cultural overlay, you know, that all going to take time. But at least we have this in, but then adding something like, um, some something like leaving, an, leaving it open, like a consultation, you know, or furthermore, you know, you know, involvement when the, when, when the project comes up. So, so me and um, Cody, we get consulted a lot, and that's a good thing. So I'm trying to figure out, like, keep this in here, but at the same time, check check the, the, the ones that need to be involved when the time comes for the project, meaning it's we're not going to do the greenways, but it's still, um, we can look at it but we're not going to sign them off kind of stuff. So I'm just trying to find something where I think important for leave this, but with, with words that can um, keep it open um, to, for the experts to, to weigh in on it. Is the Greenway good or not good? So it could kind of leave it up to, to the community or the guys that know what they're talking about in, in the point in time when that comes up. If that that works, Everett, I'm withdraw my motion. And how about um, how about this? We we leave all the language that's there now in, and then add another sentence, with priority being given to the health of the wetlands over that of the greenways and multi-use paths. I have a, uh, can you add protection for the health and protection 
of the wetlands to that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so can you help me on that? So the, the last sentence would be, with priorities being given to the health and protection of the wetlands. Okay. Yeah, I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second for the discussion. Um, can we read just one more time before we actually go to top that? I gotta, rem I gotta remember what I just said. <laughs> okay, so we keep what's there now, and then we add one more sentence with priority being given to the health and protection of the wetlands. Discussion? Um, support the study of integrating, or support the study yeah, of integrating wetlands and drainage ways. So there's an emphasis, we're gonna do a study, just throwing that word in the beginning and then what you had said at the end. So you'd be adding support these um, studies mm -hmm. of the integration of wetlands. Yeah. Okay, let me, let me read it from the top. Okay. Support the studies of the integration of wetlands and drainage ways with greenways and multi-use paths in and around the Lapua Business District period. And um, with, with priority with, given. With there. priority, okay, no, take out the period with priority being given to the health and preservation of the wetlands. Protect, protection. But health and protection of the wetlands. <laughs> yes, second that. Okay, everybody got it? Any objections? I find a motion has passed. So I've been doing this, any objections, but feel free to raise your hand and say, I wanna discuss this some more, I just wanna, if it looks like everyone's agreed, I just want to move on. Okay, how about a five minute break? Five minutes is up. Back to the grind. Okay, we're at 2.1.14, which is uh, <clears throat> support the creation and implementation of <clears throat> transit-oriented development that will, that will provide a mix of land uses, provide housing close to jobs, services, schools, and recreation, and provide convenient and safe mobility options, including walking, biking, and transit options. Is, is there a motion to adopt this? Moved by Brian, second. Second by the Hua. And discussion. The Hua. So while you're thinking, and just a comment, uh, in my my past experience, transit-oriented development usually talked about like putting housing next to a subway stop or, or a, 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 a bus path or a, a light rail, that kind of thing, or, or even a train station. In other words, getting people from one, from where they lived to where they work, or, or where, they, where they went to school, or, or perhaps where they shop. I think this is a little bit more broad, broad interpretation, because it's, um, I mean, this is great, it's great, in my opinion, this is good what it says, but this is a broader interpretation than, than the, the one I'm used to hearing of transit-oriented development. And since people are still thinking, <laughs> I'll just baffle on. Uh, this is really, really important to me that people be able to uh, to live and work and, and play and go to school without having to take a car. That's really central to how we're going to get out of this mess that we're in with, with all the traffic and segregation and other things. Chair, if I may. Uh, yes. Uh, just something to keep in mind, there is uh, in Appendix D a series of definitions for common terms. Um, Transit-oriented development is not necessarily in there, transit is, but um, some of the other things that came up before 
are like complete streets. Um, so if you're ever wondering if there's a concise definition, you can always look in Appendix D if you're curious. Thank you. Mike? Bob, I concur that this is very important. Uh, we keep talking about a walkable, bikeable community, but uh, and we're not. We're autocentric. And unless we do something different uh, like this, we're going to stay the same. Everybody's going to just, well, it's much more convenient to jump in my car. Well, for, for an individual it is, but not for a community it isn't. And that's what we're trying to do. This is a community plan. So we, if we can make it conducive, just like um, making it safer for bicycling. More people would ride bikes, more parents would send their kids to school on a bike if it was safer. So it, this is a step to try to get away from the auto-centric. So I think I agree with you, very important. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, this is more just a comment, food for thought kind of thing. Um, our, our visitor industry is a hot topic nowadays, right? There's even suggestions and um, thoughts of limiting these things. Um, if you remember, I know during the lockdown, uh, start of the pandemic, uh, there were a lot of educational moments for me. I didn't know there were 20,000 plus rental cars on this island. Did you guys? We had more than Oahu. And they shipped a lot of them back to the mainland. How does it feel right now? Like they all came back? in full force, yeah? There's places that I've traveled, had the pleasure of traveling through the South Pacific where um, rental cars were so expensive that the resorts provided all these activities for their visitors, you know, tours, vans, things like that. Um, at what point do we, you know, stop stepping aside and just allowing the visitor industry because they, they, they spend all this money to come here and, um, to kind of run amok, just food for thought. I mean, East Maui is a whole nother issue too, right? I mean, that, that infrastructure, if you want to call it that, was never meant to have the amount of cars that goes back there now to the point where the local people are like, hey, stop. And it's a sign of hostility, which is so like un aloha, but yet we are a warrior culture, so when provoked, it, it bites, yeah? So aloha is only so much until it has to be like, the other way around. But anyway, I'll just food for thought, you guys. Mahalo nui. Yeah, this is only part of the problem. And part, I mean, to solve the tra transportation problem, it's not just uh, transitory development, which is about how <clears throat> people who live here will get around. It's also, we also need to deal with uh, <clears throat> visitors and how, the, how they get around. I think we're ready for a decision here. Any objections to uh, 2.1.14 as written? And we have adopted 2.1.14. 2.1.15. Support the development of a Kihei transit hub with adequate space to expand and incorporate multimodal transportation options that promote safe, efficient travel through South Maui while improving mobility access. Do we have a motion? Again, a motion could be to dismiss or, I mean, to drop or to adopt. But we need a motion. Uh, who makes the motion? Do we have a second? Second by Novotova. Okay, I'll just make one little comment here, that there's a, a lot of discussion in, in this section about transportation travel through South Maui, but to really solve our problems, we have to be looking at getting to and from South Maui, because a lot of the people, even if they'd rather work in South Maui, they can't. They have to work someplace else, and, and vice versa. So I think just in general, when we talk about solving transportation problems, we should be thinking about that too not just getting within South Maui, but also getting to and from. It's not going away. Hello? 
So when we had the presentation by the, um, I guess, Transportation Department, they did mention something about having um, a transit hub, I think, mm -hmm. that w it would make it um, just a little bit more efficient, you know. So, of course, it uh, incorporating, you know, like what you just stated. But I think that's why they mentioned something about also in Ma'alaya having something. So I think this is just one area. I just want to recognize that I do agree with you. But if we, should we incorporate that in here as well or just stick with this, with what you were trying to say, the importance of, you know, looking at the other route? Uh, Chair, just to clarify, there is a action item specifically addressing the Maulaya, um, refers to it as a transit, or a transfer station, but a transit hub, yeah, as well. So yeah, you'll be getting to that when you get to the action items too. I'm actually going even beyond Ma'alaya. <laughs> I'm thinking that people, I, I know people who, who work in, on the west side who live in South Maui, quite a few actually. And unfortunately, a bunch of people who do this the opposite. And so that, that is a problem. And uh, I think it would make sense to mention that, that it's not just through South Maui, but it's actually also to and from South Maui is important. I don't think it defeats the purpose of this, of this, this, uh, uh, this item. The transit hub fills that purpose too. Chair, um, uh, sure. Tova. Uh, in light of that, could we do a friendly amendment to add efficient travel to and through South Maui? Um, because I, I think I was just internalizing what you were saying in this, but you're right. The language is only talking about through and. What was the report? 49% of people coming to the south side are coming from Kahului. We definitely need to have that two part handled by whatever transit hub we're doing. Yeah, to and through. I, I sort of assumed if you were coming, you're also going, but maybe that's presumptuous. <laughs> well, there's, who would want to leave South Maui once they got here? Lou, <laughs> would you accept that amendment? Yes. Okay, with that, with that uh, amendment, so it says, um, say efficient, efficient travel through and to South Maui. Any objections? Uh, I think we've adopted uh, 2 to 1 to 15 with that small addition. Two to one dot seventeen. Ensure coordination of the timing of roadway improvements, Ooh. whether private or public, so that concurrent roadway closures and traffic disruptions are minimized. I wonder where that comes from. Everett moves. Uh, Chair. Uh, yes. This is a. Uh, oh, sorry, but <clears throat> This is something that planning department uh, discussed, and the reality of this actually happening. We're proposing to replace ensure with encourage because there are situations where it's just not possible. We, we, we make our best efforts to do this, but we're just in the spirit of being honest and saying it how it is. Everett, hey, so uh, encourage, encourage coordination. Uh, I'm sorry, who, who, who seconded that? No, wait, okay. Seconded by Brian. Encourage coordination. I wish it was possible to have stronger language there. <laughs> I understand what you're saying. Uh, Mike? I, I always advocate for the strong language, and I uh, understand the professionals uh, giving us good guidance, but it's hard enough. We see it happening right now with construction on the South Kihei Road and on the highway. And they're supposed to be coordinating, but sometimes they're not. And it's just, um, you know, both, both closing at the same time and each one points the finger at the other. Well, the other guy didn't tell me. So if we're only gonna encourage them, I, I think it's, it's worse than, I think we should keep it insure. That's my perspective. Everett. Uh, 
Mike, the problem is that uh, Piolani State and South Kihei's County, so, um, and this being a county plan, we can't, uh, we can't control the state. So encourage, we can encourage the state, but we can't ensure. Yes, I, I just, I had voiced that same thing a uh, short, like short time ago, that the state doesn't have to listen to us. So I get that point, but I just hate to give up a little bit stronger language for something that uh, should be imperative. It, it seems like it, uh, but yeah, the county, mm -hmm doesn't seem to have the ability to tell the state what to do. So I get the point. But just hypothetically, suppose that there was a long lasting work on the highway and a relatively short lasting work on South Kihei Road. And uh, it was about three weeks between when the, the uh, work on South Kihei Road started and, and when the, road, the work on Pilani Highway would end. Isn't there a possibility that the county could start a little bit later? And that would solve that coordination problem. We can't control the state, but we can. But the county can control the county. So I say this not having worked in public works, but I can say that um, you know it's not that simple. We hire contractors. They're set to start on certain days. There's. Um, weather, there's staffing, there's so many different factors that go into play. I mean, anybody who's tried to build a house or do any kind of big project, you know that things need to happen in certain order. And you may think, oh, it's easy, we'll just postpone it for three weeks. But we're relying on a contractor who we've hired and they may say no. You know, we've got a contract and we're going to got a notice to proceed and we're going to start tomorrow because we have another job lined up in three weeks that we have contracted for and we're going to go work on that one in three weeks. So it's, it's, it's really not that easy. Um, I understand, Mike, that you, you want the stronger language, but it, I, can, I can ensure you that it's, it's not going to happen if you put it in there. Whereas if we say encourage, at least we can try to work on it and it gives us an opportunity because you've all, it's also included in here about private, which that makes me really nervous, but we can keep it in there. But like we have no control over a, what a private person is doing um, on a road. So if they were going to do some kind of improvement on a driveway. The, the county doesn't have the ability to say, no, you can't do that today because we got another project going on down here. So, I think it says roadway, not driveways. But uh, and then I think in some cases you might know like a year, year and a half in advance, like with the Pilani Highway. So you, there is some time to do some planning there. Uh, Everett? Yeah, I'm continuing on that that um, those thoughts, a lot of these funds are either state funds or federal funds that is, you use it or lose it. So um, if we hold back on a county project, we might lose the funding. So I think insurers about as good as we're gonna be able to do. Encourage, excuse me. Thank you. Hey, Mike. I would just give an example of um, of the promised sidewalk for the, uh, uh, in North Kihei for the project, is the developer was committed to doing the sidewalk on the side street. The county was committed to doing it on Hukai. The, the developer's got his done. The county is still struggling with getting permits from another department. So it's not always the, um, the challenge, the contractor gets it done. Sometimes it's, it's our own uh, department. Uh, uh, Public Works has a contract with a developer to build the sidewalk. The contractor says, I'm ready to go. Public Works says, well, we got to get an SMA permit from them. And they haven't even applied for the permit yet. They, they are now going to get a 
pay somebody else, another private firm, to give them guidance how to get the permit. This is after four years. So it's not always the private entities that are holding up. Sometimes it's, it's our own government that's holding it up. It doesn't mean that, that the wording has to be one way or another. It just, I want to cite that as an example. Okay, we have, we have one motion which has been seconded. Uh, any objections? Okay, I find we have adopted a motion with uh, changing insurer to encourage. The last policy in the transportation section, of course, you're free to suggest additional policies, but the last proposed policy. 2.1.18, require the use of best management practices and green infrastructure to address stormwater runoff <clears throat> and drainage issues related to the transportation system. Moved by Everett. Second. Seconded by Brian. Discussion? Uh, Tova? Just to say it's a good move. I've been disappointed recently visiting some new developments that had every opportunity to do a curb cut here or there and have the water drain to the garden or drain to the grassed area, and they don't. And I don't know how we aren't doing better. This is not new technology. This is just water flows downhill and it gets absorbed in grass. So um, I highly support this as a required policy. Yeah, I, mean, I think one of the places this will come to play very soon, hopefully, is on the next segment of the North-South Collector Road. Any further discussion? Any objections to 2.1.18 as written? I find that has passed. And I'll just make a last call on, the, on this policy section. Is there anything anyone else would like to propose as an additional policy? Hey, Brian? I, I'm not sure if it's a policy or an action. So it's more of a kind of a question first to QOQ. Because I think you raised a really good, made a good comment about tourism and the amount of cars that we have and what hotels could or potentially be doing. I, I would propose that we Help me understand, would that be a better policy or an action? And I don't know, actually even know how to word it yet, but I just think the comment you made kind of resonated with me, that we don't have anything in place that's kind of saying, hey, we got to take a pause. And There actually are a, a couple of actions proposed, and I added a couple more. Uh, but I, I was trying to think of how, how we would complement those with policies and couldn't really come up with anything. And I, I also talked to uh, Lauren Armstrong, the outgoing uh, executive director of the MPO, and she didn't come up with anything either, anything more about that particular. It seems like they're most on the action side. Okay. I, 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 I think my, it was more of an action, but yeah. I just wanted to make but sure I'll, we didn't lose Gioki's, because I yeah. think it was a really good point. But I'll, I'll defer to Kathleen or someone else from planning if you have a... Well, you do have an action that talks about providing frequent direct route public transportation from the airport. Um, we could we could add I, I'm pretty sure the West Maui community plan has language in there about support you know encouraging the hotels to provide rental cars on property like things like that that sort of minimize the amount of cars that are on the road um, shuttles buses so we could come up with something um, Kathleen I know you, you kind of jumped ahead, and I don't want to, I'm sorry to kind of like, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Um, I remember uh, reviewing that particular action and um, really, really being a little puzzled on why um, taxpayer money should be supporting transportation to hotels. I don't know if I misread or understood it, but just when I was doing because sometimes I do this a little later at night, <laughs> so I kind of revisit it later and be like, was that what I read or what? But I'm like... Okay, there's parts of that I agree with, and then there's the, the part of the hotel part, I'm like, uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> we shouldn't pay for people's transportation from the hotel, from the, anyway, 
Um, I know that I don't know where it is as far as legislation goes, but I know that there's 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 movement on this whole topic with uh, actually limiting the amount of tourists. I mean, every island has its unique circumstances. They're all kind of the same but different. So, but I know that it's 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 there's something. So it's almost like a to be continued kind of thing, but real soon, sooner than later, right? So. I know that didn't help, but it's just my thoughts right now. Like it's it's coming. Like something's something's gonna be acted on soon. I mean, you hear it on the news and read it in the newspapers, and yeah. So to introduce an action, or maybe we'll sleep on that one. Yeah. Sleep on. Average had something. Can continue along those that kind of line of thought. Um, a few, maybe, gosh, it was probably 10 years ago, there was some discussion about a, a $25 fee added on to rental cars. And we calculated how much money that would generate. And it was a, it was a lot of money. I mean, it was like, I mean, it was a huge, many, many, many millions of dollars. And then the thought was, okay, now you've got this revenue stream and then you could float a bond and use that bond to do North South Collect Road, use that bond to do, to build the infrastructure, which is basically being paid for by the rent a car tax. Um, it required, um, it required a, some legislative action in, by the state to do. And there wasn't, under that governor, there wasn't um, a desire to support it. But that's something that would really benefit Maui if we could do that. It would all it would do two things. It would discourage renting rental cars because they'd be that much more expensive. And it would add a revenue stream for the county that could then float a bond. And, oh, and, and another thing on that bill when it was discussed way back when was the the money would have to stay on the within the county that it was generated. Yeah, thank you, Everett, for your manual. I, I, I agree. Um, at some point, well, I agree with that, but at some point, it's, 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 a, it's a dangerous same old, same old game when we, we accept something because it creates revenue to cover something. There's always like, I, I, I don't feel like we're being innovative enough because in the long run, it still contributes to a problem in a certain way. You know what I mean? So that's just another food for thought thing. Sorry, I ponder on many an item. Thank you, you guys. So I just want to point out, though, that I mean, I agree with what, much of what's been said, but uh, a bus from the airport wouldn't just benefit visitors. It would benefit a lot of us, too. I would take that bus rather than having to drive my car. Yeah, so for me, just reading that action that you mentioned, um, sorry again, not to get ahead. I know it's in further discussion, but there's portions of it that I agreed with. It just that that one part about the hotel just kind of stuck out. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, I have to have a suggestion, which is in the action section, which is uh, a tax on hotels that don't provide airport shuttles and use that revenue to provide an, an airport service, because that way you're, you're uh, um, because if if they're not doing it, it means that everyone else is suffering. They'll be renting cars or or we'll have to provide bus service for them, so it's reasonable that they pay for it. And that would encourage them to do that. But anyway, that'll come up under the action section. And that's kind of feeding it back. So we, we have a few minutes left, but uh, no, normally I would say, let's just quit now, but uh, we, there are so many actions in this transportation section. I'm wondering, what, what do you guys think about starting on that? Should we start on the, on the action section, or should we just... Wait until the fourth, to January. Call it quits. Second. Further discussion. <laughs> Wait, what was that? Okay. Are we voting out or voting in? I was. Okay. I was willing to do the ten more minutes. <laughs> okay. We are adjourning at eight twenty-five. <laughs>